Jeffrey Snover, uh, Microsoft Technical Fellow, and I'm joined by Joey, who's walking off the stage. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to give you the state of the shell. All right, it's 2019, and guess what? PowerShell has never been more important. Why is that? And the answer is, it's because the world runs on software. Now, in 2011, Mark Andreessen wrote a very important paper. He said that that paper is called Software Eats the World. I recommend you find this paper and you read it. It's a very short read, but if you haven't read it, let me give you the gist of it. He basically makes two arguments. Argument number one, software is eating traditional businesses. Which is say there's an existing business and a pure software play is competing against that business and winning. Okay, so think about uh, telecom, Skype, uh, think about music, iTunes, Spotify, bookstores being attacked by Amazon, online software. Okay, so number one argument is that traditional businesses are being attacked by software only plays. The next argument he made was that for those businesses that will continue to have a physical product, think about a car that they, the value of that product, will be increasingly the software component of that product. So a car today uh, has somewhere between 10 million and 100 million lines of code, okay? The more expensive the car, the more the value of that car is being delivered through software, okay? So whether it's cars, defenses, so think about the car, right? Infotainment systems, um, uh, safety systems, uh, navigation systems, these are software products delivered. So, two arguments. One, traditional businesses being attacked by software. Two, businesses that continue to exist, products that continue to exist, more and more the value of that product is software. He said companies in every industry, every industry, need to assume a software revolution is coming. Now, here's the latest data I have. I should update this, but here's the data I have as of 2017. This is a list of the largest companies uh, marked, uh, uh, sorted by market capitalization. The highlighted ones are those businesses whose primary value is delivered through software. Okay? Over half of the largest companies in the world are software companies. Is that amazing or what? Now, I'll also note that a number of those that I didn't highlight, a substantial portion of their value is software, but I chose to just highlight the ones whose core value is software. Now, Mark Andreessen wrote that paper in 2011. This was the list of the top market, uh, top market capitalization companies in the world. The highlighted ones, are those whose value is primarily driven through software, okay? So in 2011, he says, software is going to take over the world. This is the way he looks at it, okay? A mere six years later, over half of the largest companies are driven through software, okay? Microsoft acquired LinkedIn. What that really means is we've got a very good bead on where jobs are. And it turns out that the latest numbers show that there are more software jobs being offered in non-technology companies than from technology companies. So guess what? Software eats the world. And it's going to be in every single company. Now, that's all kind of cool and abstract, but let me just give you an example of, of where you might see this, okay? So if you came to this conference, there's a good chance you flew. You might have flown on Alaska Airlines or British Airways or any number of these. And by the way, this is kind of skewed towards Azure, uh, but it's sort of cloud in general and software in general. Uh, those companies that I mentioned uh, have a number of their systems, Virgin Atlantic and, and others, have a lot of their customer-facing systems being driven by the cloud. So if you show up at one of these uh, uh, lounges, uh, you'll log in and you'll be running software that's being driven off the cloud. You might have flown here on a plane that was done by Boeing. Uh, Boeing recently is moving a bunch of their IoT software to Azure. 
Uh, they did a stress test of that with our event handling. Uh, they ran, I think it was 50 billion events through our event processing in a stress test. Uh, worked very well, except the next day they called with a complaint. They said, hey, there's something wrong with your billing system. Our stress test of a couple 50 billion uh, events, uh, we got a bill for $56. So that can't be right. And we said, yeah, no, of course that can't be right. We audited that. Turned out it was right. They said, yay. We said, huh. <laughs> So, so, yay, yay cloud. Now, now that, that Boeing plane might have had a Rolls-Royce engine. Rolls-Royce engine is delivering fuel as a service. A software service in the cloud compares fuel utilization and fuel efficiency across different uh, flights by different uh, operators and then can su provide suggestions as to how to operate the flight in a more fuel efficient way because fuel is one of the most expensive parts of an airline. You might, when you get somewhere, you might need some cash, so you go to a cash reg uh, an ATM by Bank of America or, or one of these other things. These are all running uh, software systems in the cloud. On the way over, you might have grabbed a cup of coffee. Now, if you go to Starbucks and you use their mobile application, that mobile application is running in, or back end is running in Azure. They use machine learning algorithms on open source software. So Azure is not just Windows, it's open source and Linux. So they got a Linux Spark a cluster, uh, and they're using machine learning algorithms to tell where you are and where you're going to pick up your order so they know when you're going to arrive, and then they, man they uh, rework the work order for the barista so to provide you the freshest product available. Crazy stuff. You might have taken Uber. If you take an Uber, the, the uh, driver logs in using a facial recognition machine learning uh, service in Azure to make sure that that driver is who he says he is. That driver might have gotten a BMW <clears throat> with his BMW, Toyota, etc. Their infotainment and, and uh, voice navigation systems are all running backed by Azure services. The driver of that car might have saved 15% or more using GEICO. Uh, GEICO is an insurance manufacturer. Interesting thing about GEICO is that they never would advertise during a large sporting event. And the reason for that was that their back-end systems couldn't handle a burst load. Uh, last year, they moved to Azure, and then uh, again, for the Super Bowl, they announced, and they were able to deal with the surge through the dynamic scaling of Azure. And then when uh, the event went over, they scaled back down, saving money. Uh, the, so the gas that they got might have come from Chevron, whether it's Chevron or others. Many of these people are using back-end systems in Azure. In fact, some of them are, in fact, Chevron is replacing their entire data center with an Azure data center. So the point I'm making here is that technology and software is permeating all industries, all industries. That means great opportunity for you. Okay, so the world runs on software, and the challenge with that is, boy, there's a lot of stuff out there, right? There's lots of opportunities, right? There's containers, um, uh, blockchain, bots, IoT, microservices, automation. There's just a ton of things to figure out and use. And as you do that, there's a whole bunch of challenges, right? The business, business is betting on you to tell them what are the safe bets, what are the not safe bets, when do you do things like sh uh, serverless, how do you move to DevOps, which code should we use, which cloud should we use, whether I use SaaS or PaaS. There's a ton of things where people are the key component between potential success with technology and actual success with successful implementations. So, <laughs> the challenge with this environment of incredible opportunity and incredible stuff is how do you manage it, right? How do you keep that all in your head, okay? Now, PowerShell plays an important role in that. And let me go back to our sacred vow. When we started this, we had something, we said, hey, listen, we know your hair's on fire, and the last thing you want to do is to stop and learn a new language. And we made what we call the sacred vow. We said, stop, learn this new language. And if you do that, learn PowerShell, we will make you more valuable. 
okay? And so the idea here is that in a world that runs on software, automation is absolutely critical, absolutely critical. Now, here's the reason, here's the thing. The world always has been, is, and always will be messy. It has been messy because there's legacy systems that you never get rid of. They're always there. And even if today you say, hey, I finally get everything dialed in and it's clean and I know what to do, there's innovation. And with that innovation, it breaks the rules, and so it's always messy. PowerShell can't fix that mess, but what we can do is we can make it a lot better. Okay? So first, we want to make PowerShell ubiquitous. We want to make it heterogeneous. We want to make it available in lots of hosts. We want to make it smaller and faster so that you can learn PowerShell, learn to glue together the messy world to solve problems, and then have the skill that you learned with PowerShell apply, whether it's Unix or Windows today or Linux tomorrow or a mixture of Windows and Linux, um, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's on-premise, whether it's using Hyper-V, whether it's using VMware, whether it's using AWS or with the great jackets, uh, thank you very much, <laughs> or Google Cloud or Azure, the skills you have learned in PowerShell, you can bring to bear to each of those environments. Right? So we want to adapt PowerShell to the new technologies that are so important in the cloud, things like REST and JSON, serverless environments. And we want to be able to allow you to participate. Right? There's only so much that we see, and there's only so many resources that we have to address the priorities that Microsoft has. Uh, but you might have different priorities, and you might have different uh, needs. So we want to make it open source so that you can participate in that uh, to, one, always understand exactly how the product works. You can go in and see the code itself, like, why did that happen? And you can say, hey, uh, that isn't meeting my needs. Why don't I change the code and then do a pull request and make the product better? So at the end, our sacred vow is all about making power, is PowerShells here to make you successful. Now, PowerShell is and always has been ahead of conventional wisdom. So this phrase, conventional wisdom, there's a particular story about that. When I became a technical fellow, that's uh, 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 the top of the individual contributor stack at Microsoft. It's an executive level uh, uh, position. And I got invited to Satya Nadella's e extended staff. And so the first thing he does is he uh, welcomes all the new executives and he says, you know, welcome to the room. You know, congratulations, your days of whining are over. <laughs> he said, in this room, we manufacture success. Uh, he said, now, I want to be clear. Um, you know, you have the resources that you have, and you need to manufacture success with the resources we've allocated. No whining, no coming up to me saying, oh, I could be successful if I only had 400 more people. So we've allocated the uh, uh, resources you have to, be, to manufacture success with. He says, now, in order to succeed, you're going to have to do two things. You have only two degrees of control. Number one is the culture and enthusiasm and energy you infuse into your team, and it's resource allocation. And here's where it got very interesting. He says, in order to succeed in this room, you need to be a growing business. You need to allocate your resources ahead of conventional wisdom. If you're doing what everybody knows is the safe and easy and obvious play, uh, you will not generate the kind of growth we need to succeed as a company. So you need to allocate your, your um, um, uh, resources ahead of conventional wisdom. And he said, I'll be, interested, be very clear with you. When you do that, you will be occasionally wrong. And he said, I will stick with you if you're wrong, if you do two things. One is that you're intellectually honest, and by intellectually honest I mean you always have a plausible theory of success, and number two is that you're constantly monitoring that theory, and when it's no longer plausible, you're making changes. So just a really profound uh, insight into a great way to run a company. So the point I want to go back and highlight is this idea of investing ahead of conventional wisdom. PowerShell has always been ahead of conventional wisdom. So when I came to the company and I said, hey, 
you know, Microsoft Windows. Uh, we need a command line interface. That's the key to success in server. This was very far ahead of conventional wisdom. You might have heard the story about me getting demoted uh, to work on this project. Uh, I got demoted and it took me five years to get my, my level back. Um, we had executives, you know, kind of yelling at me, saying exactly what part of effing Windows is confusing you. Uh, there was definitely not obvious that a command line interface in a Windows world was the right thing to do. But it was the right thing to do. Now, PowerShell version 1, when we shipped that in 2006, it was at least 20 times more powerful than command.exe. Right? You had richer command structure, you had extensibility, you know, it was at least 20 times more powerful. Now, when I had a conversation with Chef, Chef uh, made a strong commitment to desired state configuration. And when they made that decision, I had a talk with the CEO and I said, well, you know, what made you feel comfortable making this big bet? Because he said, yeah, well, you know, we're betting the company on desired state configuration. I said, well, what makes you comfortable doing that? And he said, I've looked at Microsoft and you guys often produce great technologies and then don't stick with it. You come and then it gets dropped. He says, but with PowerShell, it's been a story of consistent investment. You had PowerShell version one, great product, at least 20 times more powerful than command.exe. But then what did you do? You invested and you delivered PowerShell two. And then you invested and delivered PowerShell three. And then we did four and five. And he says that gave us the confidence that this was a, a product of continued investment and it was something safe to bet my company on. So at some point we stopped and we said, hey, let's look at where we are and let's look at where we need to be. And this is when we again saw the future, the future of the cloud, the future of a heterogeneous environment. And we invested in .NET Core and then PowerShell Core. This was ahead of conventional wisdom. A lot of people in our community, maybe a lot of people in this room said, what are you doing? That makes no sense at all. Uh, but we were ahead of conventional wisdom when we went down this path. Now, as I mentioned, PowerShell, um, if you took a look at the original Monad manifesto, I broke it down into a number of categories, right? There was an automation model. Automation model, a shell, management models, remote scripting, and a managing console. And then for each one, version one, like 20 times more powerful than command.exe. Version two, we continue to advance it. We get script commandlets, uh, you know, more programming, jobs, eventing, added remoting, the key thing, and interactive script editing with debugging. Version three, huge addition, you doing the um, .NET uh, JIT compiling, uh, jobs, uh, run as, constrained environments, version four and version five. So we continue to invest in this area. Um, now, the reason I point this out is command.exe. Command.exe, I think, has not had a substantial you know, improvement made to it in at least 20 years, and yet we continue to ship it in the box. Why is that? And the answer is it's continued to be used, okay? And a number of people still use it, and so we continue to ship it. Windows version, sorry, Windows PowerShell uh, version 1 was over 20 times more powerful than command.exe. We continue to invest. This is very extensible, uh, extremely extensible, extremely powerful, uh, extremely capable, and we are putting a coat of shellac. We're sealing PowerShell version, uh, Windows PowerShell version 5. Uh, we continue to ship that inbox and continue to support it as long as people use it. But now we've started a new thing, and that new thing is PowerShell Core. I think I switched to you. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Jeffrey. Appreciate it. So we're just going to dive a little bit more into to sort of the future of PowerShell Core, why we, why we chose these goals, sort of how we've been doing along the way uh, in accomplishing these goals and, and what we need to do next to, to continue our path to success. So as Jeffrey said, a big part of our, our roadmap here is ubiquity, right? PowerShell needs to be everywhere. Uh, so this is, is across the platforms, across various uh, hosting models, different clouds, uh, different uh, processor architectures, um, really, really getting it everywhere so that you guys have the ability to manage everything uh, in, this, in this very heterogeneous hybrid world. Uh, cloud readiness. So 
This is all about sort of managing, you know, this transition from a very uh, micromanagement approach to to managing your servers, having these these individual machines that you treat as you know family members or, or as pets, to this sort of cloud and services management world where uh, you're you're building up resources, you're scaling up and down very rapidly, uh, you're interfacing with uh, REST APIs that are. Uh, very disparate and, and may be uh, schematized in very different ways. Uh, but it also means that we need to participate in these sort of new architectures for hosting models, so serverless cloud, uh, Docker containers, containers in general, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And lastly, you know, I think we can all agree that the community is the lifeblood of PowerShell and that really it wouldn't be where it is today without all of you in this room and, and, and the people that extend uh, throughout the PowerShell community across the world. Um, and so building that into the central design of PowerShell Core and, and the interaction model with which we engage with you guys uh, was really critical to, to making sure that, that PowerShell continued to be successful going forward. So one of the, the big aspects of Ubiquity here is the operating system. Uh, this is the list of operating systems that we currently support. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, as Jeffrey talked about, there's a lot of we do in PowerShell that, that tends to be ahead of conventional wisdom. Um, and sometimes that means making brave choices about how we treat down level. Uh, Windows Management Framework was a great example of this. You know, we, we fought very hard to make sure that as we upgraded the version of PowerShell in, in new versions of Windows uh, and Windows Server, that we continue to deliver that innovation to the machines that you weren't able to bring forward to new operating systems. Um, and we've continued that with, with PowerShell Core and making sure that we continue to support Windows 7 and 2008 R2 uh, for the, the extent of their lifespan. Um, I don't know if anybody saw, but we just announced that we, uh, if, you, if you lift and shift your, your uh, uh, Windows 7 and, and 2.8, 08 R2 VMs uh, into Azure, we're going to support them for another two or three years. That was a very recent announcement uh, that, that wasn't anticipated by a lot of folks, but it put us in a very good position um, having PowerShell Core already supporting those operating systems uh, as, as close as 2020 felt uh, when, we, when we first started this product. Um, obviously, Mac OS, uh, you know, this long tail of Linux distributions. Uh, Alpine is a great example of a place where we've uh, invested a little ahead. Uh, this is a, a, a Linux operating system that's optimized for container runtimes. It's very, very small. Uh, we've also been experimenting with ARM32 and ARM64 architectures across both Windows and Linux. Um, and we've had some really, really awesome moments when uh, folks show up saying, you know, it would really be nice if I had some kind of PowerShell that I can run on, uh, on ARM64. Uh, and we say, that's, that's great. We, we have that just sitting right over here. Um, additionally, all these different package formats, you know, we, we we support X copyability of PowerShell Core. This is actually one of my favorite features of, of PowerShell Core. Uh, it's, it's often overlooked is the, really the ability to just drag and drop it into a folder anywhere on your file system and execute it uh, without having to reboot, without having to update your version of .NET. Um, soon we'll be updating PowerShell Core to throw it in the Microsoft Store, uh, and we'll also be making it a .NET global tool. I'd actually hoped that that one was uh, uh, shipped by now. We're, we're very, very close with some, some internal uh, uh, bureaucracy. Um, but we also support Snap packages, which is uh, you know a, a, a canonical. The, the folks that run Ubuntu, their new sort of uh, container-based format for for installing packages, Docker packages as well, um, and then PowerShell Editor Services, which is the engine that drives VS Code PowerShell. Um, we've we've sort of pushed that throughout our community, uh, and it's been supported now in uh, Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio via the uh, Posh tools run by Adam Driscoll, Azure Data Studio, which is a new editor we put out for DBAs, uh, JetBrains IntelliJ, and then uh, Vim8 slash NeoVim. Uh, and, and a lot of these have been done by the community, but it really enables people, regardless of your choice of editor, to, to build PowerShell modules and, and debug PowerShell scripts. So real quickly, I'm going to show uh, this awesome demo that sort of demonstrates uh, you know, how far this ubiquity has come. Um, so I've got a, a Visual Studio uh, script here. Oh, we can't see anything. It's the, yeah, it's the very dark theme, right? Um, so let's get into the ISC theme here. Great, let's make it a little bigger. So this is a very simple uh, PowerShell module without a manifest. Um, it does one thing. It uh, basically decides, hey, am, am I on Windows or am I on Linux? And if I'm on Windows, I say, hey, I'm on Windows. Check out my get computer info. And if I'm on Linux, it's going to run instead uname-a, which doesn't give us quite a, the amount of information as get computer info, but it will give us some information about the machine. 
So here you can see I'm in Windows. I'm running PowerShell. Um, I've actually updated all the way to PowerShell 7 here. So I'm running the latest preview.1 of PowerShell 7. Um, and I can go ahead and import module on this WSL demo. And then I'm just going to run get environment info. Very basic. This is why we tap complete. Yay. So this is going to run get computer info. You'll see you know, the string got emitted. Yep, I'm on Windows. Look at me. Here's all this great stuff about my environment. And I didn't run any of this Linux stuff. Now, when we build these scripts, you know, we want to make sure when we build modules that we know are going to be executed across different environments, we want to be able to easily test that those work on different platforms, which is why we build CI systems that, that have multiple operating systems that run uh, every time we commit a PR into our version control and that sort of thing. But sometimes it's kind of annoying to wait for all those PRs to run. Uh, and, and really, we've been working really hard at Microsoft and making Windows a much more viable development platform for, for cross-platform, which is why we've introduced uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux that allows us to run uh, a Linux uh, environment right from within Windows. So um, I'm going to be showing this all week. This is actually the new uh, Windows terminal that we announced at Build. It's really awesome. Um, I've got this great drop down here with all my possible shells. Um, and I can just click uh, WSL. Uh, and this is going to give me a little uh, Linux tab. And you'll see already I'm, I'm just running right here within Linux. Um, now, I've gone ahead and set up another new feature of Visual Studio Code called Remote Development. And it basically allows me to run a, a small little headless server inside of this Linux environment that uh, Visual Studio Code will automatically connect to and allow me to execute and host all of my uh, extensions for Visual Studio Code very seamlessly. So I've got another instance right here of, uh, uh, and I will go ahead and change the theme, apologies. It's another instance here of Visual Studio Code Insiders. And you'll notice there's one difference other than the green icon for the insiders, which is this WSL bracket up here in the, in the title bar. Um, so the way that I actually started this is I was sitting inside of, of a Linux uh, machine, this WSL, and all I had to do is run code insiders dot in the directory that I wanted to uh, open up in, in the Visual Studio Code. And it gave me this, this uh, Visual Studio Code right here. So, the great thing about this is I'm already running pwsh-preview. I have access to the exact same file system here. Um, and I'm able to do the same import module of this w, uh, uh, WSL demo. So this is the exact same code that we had before. Um, and you know the great thing is that I can have these actually side by side uh, and be doing development in both of them. Um, and if I run my get environment info, it's going to say, hey, I'm on Linux. Check out my thing. I don't have, yeah. Check out my uname-a. So this is awesome. Like this, this is what Ubiquity looks like, right? Like we have all the tools we need to build for all the platforms we might want to ship these PowerShell scripts. Uh, and I didn't have to you know, go outside of anything in, in Windows other than, than grabbing Visual Studio Code in order to do this. Uh, so really exciting times. Uh, yeah, let's get right back into it. Definitely check this thing out if you haven't already. I, it takes like 10 minutes to set up. It's really, really impressive. So just uh, going along with Ubiquity here, we've got a quick graph on our usage. Uh, we're really happy about this. We've had usage explode uh, since our 6.1 GA uh, over here. Uh, we're up to uh, almost 12 million starts right now. I think we, we just pulled the main numbers last night. They're at 11.8 million. Um, one of the interesting things you'll note about this graph is that all of this growth is coming from Linux. So you know, we've, we've finally achieved a, a little bit of growth here on the Windows side. These are our highest Windows numbers yet after a few, a few falters. Um, and, and it's interesting, actually, to see how thin this Mac number is. Uh, this can be a little bit misleading. A lot of folks would look at this graph and say, hey, why, why do you support Mac? It's probably a, a hassle. It's, it's kind of a strange platform uh, from all these other Linux distros. But the reality is that when we go to conferences, we see you know, probably half of the demos uh, in, in the last couple conferences I've been to be delivered from a, a Mac OS machine. And I think it's really important that you know, while we might have some low numbers here, uh, being able to do the development on the machine of your choice is, is a really critical part of Ubiquity as well. And knowing how many of you have MacBooks, uh, this is something we're, we're pretty firmly committed to. Uh, but it's also great to see the Windows numbers start to pop. Uh, and we do believe after uh, we ship PowerShell 7 that these numbers are going to continue going up pretty significantly. Yeah. Yes, these are monthly numbers. Yeah, so just, just definitely, uh, these are, this is not 
Uh, we only had this many starts, uh, you know, in the in the month of May. Um, so you know, it's it's crazy that you know for a whole year here we were basically a rounding error uh, in the graph when we were shipping alpha and beta. Um, so really, this is you know showing uh, uh, us being ahead of conventional wisdom yet again uh, when people said, why the hell would I want to run PowerShell on Linux? Uh, I've got Bash, are you crazy? Uh, and, and it's clear that, that there's a, a considerable chunk of people that, that are pretty happy with it. Just checking my time here, make sure we're doing okay. All right. So cloud readiness. We wanted to make sure that PowerShell core was ready for this world where everything was shifting off of on-prem and into the cloud. Uh, we know that the world is messy, as we've said. Hybrid cloud is critical part of our success, and that's why we made sure at our launch that we had uh, partnerships with uh, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, and VMware, uh, who all support PowerShell Core in some capacity, uh, in addition to Azure, which, which uh, obviously we, we support through the AZ module. We also knew, though, that it needed to be fast, lightweight, secure on all these platforms. As people scale up to the cloud, they need, they need absolute guarantees that the platforms and, and tools that they're using are bulletproof uh, and that they're, they're actually getting faster uh, when, when you're, you're hosting them in these uh, lightweight environments in the cloud or, or on smaller devices, on IoT or on the edge. We also knew that we needed to make major improvements to interface with uh, REST APIs. REST is really the language of the cloud. Uh, it's the, the sort of primitive that everything, all these cloud services speak. Uh, and in a lot of cases, in most cases, uh, the, the data that's being transmitted uh, through those REST APIs is JSON-based. And so we knew we needed to catch up a little bit in terms of, of how well we supported these industry standards. Uh, we also uh, invested, and I think Garrett Serac is in the room here. There he is over there, uh, Fear the Cowboy. Uh, in, in PowerShell for auto rest. Um, and I think he's given a presentation on this later in the week. Yep, definitely check it out. But basically, this is the ability to take a, a Swagger document, which is the, uh, the sort of specification definition of a REST API in JSON, uh, and auto-generate PowerShell commandlets from that. Uh, so really exciting stuff and, and really going to accelerate the ability to, to build commandlets uh, out of these REST APIs. We've also uh, made sure to give a second look to the way that we interface with uh, CI and CD pipelines. These are continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, for folks that are developing applications or for folks that are building uh, infrastructure at very high scale and, and need to make sure that they're running their unit tests and integration tests on a constant basis. And a lot of this means, again, the ability to host in containers or in very small, lightweight, stateless environments. And so we made sure that, that in both interactive and hosted scenarios, Azure Cloud Shell, Azure Functions, Azure Pipelines, uh, third-party CI platforms like AppVair uh, and, and uh, you know, .NET's SDK Docker containers, uh, which I'm going to show in a sec, that in all these cases, PowerShell ran very quickly uh, and, and respected the sort of statelessness of these things. So sorry, I'm just going to speed up just a little bit here. Um, this one's very, very quick. Um, basically. .NET Core ships a container uh, for their SDK that contains, uh, oh, oh no, I rebooted because my thing crashed. Just give it 30 seconds while I explain this. Um, so basically, they ship an, an SDK container. This isn't intended to run application workloads, but rather is intended for CI/CD development pipelines or even as a local interactive development tool. And it contains all the tools that you need in order to do .NET development. Well, we actually had the .NET team reach out to us uh, without us requesting, this wasn't us pushing our tooling on them at all, and they said a bunch of our customers would really like to write the same build, test, and deployment scripts uh, in one language for these cross-platform .NET Core applications that they're building. So if I'm building a .NET Core application that runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux, I really want to run, run, run one script in my CI environment that builds that thing and runs my test suite. And the obvious language of choice for many of their customers was PowerShell. Um, so they reached out to us about getting uh, PowerShell Core built into this SDK container. Um, and so I've, I've already pulled this ahead of time, but this is the command for grabbing it. But basically, uh, you know, if I'm in this CI or CD environment, I now have the ability to, to bring this SDK container in, uh, and I just have uh, PowerShell available to me right off the bat. So this doesn't, no extra modification, you can just fork straight from this container image, and in addition to having uh, a .NET, and you'll see this is actually the latest uh, .NET 3.0 preview 5. Um, you'll see this is 6.2 right now, we're, we're working on getting uh, this updated to 7.0 preview 1, uh, but, but this really just shows that uh, it's not just 
folks in this room that value PowerShell, but folks that are, are doing app development uh, in entirely different ecosystems as well uh, that, that really want PowerShell to, to make their lives easier. So talking a little bit about our third pillar here of PowerShell Core, the community, a uh, great aspect of this is the PowerShell Gallery, which has absolutely exploded in downloads in the last couple months. Um, we're seeing about 100 million uh, downloads a month now uh, of PowerShell modules. Uh, there's over 4,000 modules and scripts. Um, ra raise your hand in the room just out of curiosity if you've published something to the PowerShell Gallery. You are awesome. Thank you so much. If you have not, uh, it's really easy to do, and it's open to everyone, and we encourage all of you, if you've got some useful scripts uh, that you think anyone on the planet might find useful, uh, publish them to the gallery. In addition to the community aspect, we've had, you know, obviously Microsoft, but also VMware, Google, Amazon, Dell, HP, Lenovo, all use this as the official distribution platform for their PowerShell modules. Uh, and we've recently made some updates to the PowerShell gallery to be more inclusive. Uh, accessibility is a really big deal at Microsoft, and, and so we've, we've done some work to uh, make, it, make it better for screen readers, uh, as well as the uh, color correction for, for various uh, aspects of, of color impairment. On GitHub, we've obviously fully open sourced PowerShell. You guys have been uh, engaging with us for a few years now on this. Uh, we're holding very steady. Uh, actually, this is, this is growing. The number of PRs coming from the community is over 50%. Uh, and we have about five to 10 members that are heavy contributors, uh, many of whom are in this room. Um, I won't say by name because I'll leave someone out and I'll feel really bad, but there are tons of people that are really working almost seemingly full-time on PowerShell uh, from, from uh, outside Microsoft. Um, and we actually, in the last 30 days, had almost 90 external contributors open PRs in PowerShell. So, you know, there's both a very core set of people that are doing lots of work and this long tail of folks that are, that are cleaning up bugs and, and, you know, correcting the things for the scenarios that they need. Um, I said I wouldn't name people, but we do have a couple repo maintainers, folks that are actually uh, uh, have the ability to triage issues or commit code in these, these uh, repos, and, and we we're looking to increase this more over time, but thanks to all these folks for the hard work that you do in making sure that uh, uh, these projects stay uh, up to date. And you know we're still working through our backlog of RFCs. Uh, I've got Steve in the room here. Uh, him and I have been working very hard uh, to, to bring the committee together uh, more frequently. Uh, Kenneth and Bruce are both here as well, um, and they're able to attend these committee meetings from, uh, from Amazon. Um, and we've been working through this backlog of RFCs that has sort of built up over a little bit. And if you attend uh, some of these RFC sessions, I know Steve's got one uh, today. I'm talking briefly uh, on it with him as well in our PS Core 6.2 talk. Uh, you know, please, please find more out about this process and, and how we build PowerShell. So this is uh, just something to contextualize real quick. Um, again, over half the PRs are coming from the community. Um, but if you look here at the pull request comments, you'll note that the vast majority, these 56 percent, uh, I wouldn't say vast majority, but, but a large majority of the pull request comments are coming from Microsoft. So one of the things that we just want to point out is that while we love pull requests coming in from the community, we do have to maintain a certain quality bar with PowerShell. And so we do incur a cost uh, of, of triaging these things and doing code reviews working back and forth with contributors to make sure that the, the code that's being committed reaches the PowerShell quality bar, uh, and that is a cost for us. So that is something that, that trades off against our ability to, to build new features uh, and, and do the stuff that maybe the community is not as willing to, to chip in on. Um, but we continue to see the, the majority of issues and issue comments be created by the community, um, and we, we love it. Please keep that feedback coming. We doing? 25, I got some sand, all right. Um, <laughs> uh, so opportunities to contribute, like you're just getting started, maybe I'm not a C-sharp person, maybe I, um, I'm just getting started with PowerShell. There are opportuni opportunities for all of you to contribute to PowerShell regardless of your skill level. Um, if you're a big PowerShell scripter, we've got some standalone modules that are written in, in PowerShell, like PowerShell Get, the archive module. There are a number of others that, that sit in our community repository. Uh, if you're a DSC fan, you know, we've got a ton of these DSC resources out there. A lot of those are, are maintained by community members, and, and even more of them uh, get regular contributions from people outside Microsoft. Uh, even if it's just a little bug fix, you know, there could be a little one-liner that's been bothering you for a while, and, and you, know, you don't want to fix it on your local machine. Let the entire world enjoy that goodness uh, for, for what you've corrected for. 
And then in some cases, uh, it just means taking the stuff that you've already built um, and making it compatible with more of the ecosystem so that more folks are able to jump in. Uh, we've just shipped some script analyzer rules I'm going to be touching on in the 6.2 talk uh, that make it a lot easier for you to, to find out whether or not your module is cross-platform or works across uh, uh, different editions of PowerShell. Uh, give those a shot and, and you know, make your stuff more ubiquitous. Um, <clears throat> if you're, you're a new scripter, or maybe you don't like to, to share your code or your company has a policy that doesn't allow you to put source code out there, um, we've got a ton of documentation uh, that could use some help. Um, we're, we're, we've made a lot of progress. I'm actually really proud in the last couple of years of how far our documentation has come, but we can always use help there. Um, and, and we've got a, a great contributor guide that allows you to jump in and a, and a long list of issues uh, that have already been enumerated for, for where you can help out. As we said, these RFC proposals, these are basically uh, uh, specifications that detail you know, new features that we're proposing, possible alternative implementations of those features, alternative designs, and we encourage you highly, if you care about the future development of PowerShell, to come in and, and give us comments uh, Give us comments on those proposals so that we make sure you know, we, we build the features that, that suit your needs the best in, in PowerShell going forward. Um, you can also submit your own. A number of folks in this room, have, who's written an RFC in here? Awesome, yeah, so a lot of the folks in the front, but a couple more in the back, keep building them. Um, you know, we're, we're working through these bottlenecks and, and a lot of these are, are gonna go into PowerShell 7 and beyond. And then of course, if you're a C-sharp person, we've got a ton of stuff to do for, uh, out there. Um, obviously, PowerShell itself is, is a great place to contribute, but Script Analyzer, Editor Services, uh, the Ships module. Um, you can also make your C-sharp modules cross-platform using PowerShell Standard, uh, which is sort of our, our edition of, of .NET Standard. Won't go too far into that given the time, but if you're interested in this, just give me, uh, uh, pull me aside later after the talk. And then if you're going outside the whole .NET ecosystem, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure Tyler uh, and the rest of the folks working on the VS Code extension and PowerShell editor services would love uh, some, some help in TypeScript on the VS Code extension. So you know, there are opportunities in the PowerShell ecosystem even to, to learn more languages beyond PowerShell and C Sharp. So going quickly through the sort of history and future of PowerShell core, when we, when we first shipped PowerShell Core 6 as an alpha, uh, it was sort of an incubation. We were figuring out our path in open source and, and how we were going to sort of do this. Uh, with 6061, we got more Linux ready. We made some breaking changes that allowed us to be a little bit more cross-platform, a little more agile. As we went into 6.2, this was a bit of a, a minor release. We focused on stability. We focused on our own automation to make sure that we could continue to ship faster and faster. Uh, and then with 7.x, uh, uh, 7.0 and going forward, we recognize that, that we need to deliver a lot of this innovation back into a, uh, the, the sort of core competency of PowerShell, which has been Windows traditionally. Um, and looking at the charts of how much uh, you know, folks are still managing Windows using, using Windows PowerShell, we, we recognize that, that you guys need these features too. Um, and so to that end, uh, and I apologize, that, that should have been up front there. Um, but we realize you know, Core hasn't really been able to fully replace Windows PowerShell. So, with 7.x, this is sort of the mainstream culmination of our investments. This is us taking all this work that we've done over the last three years, which is, you know, as, as agile as we now ship, three years is still really uh, three to five years is the, the realistic uh, sort of timeline for, for shipping a large platform like this and, and doing a replat. Um, but, but this is the delivery with 7 of our sacred valve for, for heterogeneous environments, for operating the cloud, for living in this open source world and also managing Windows uh, in, in the guest and, and on-prem, just like you'd expect out of Windows PowerShell. Um, and of course, this is all using the skills that you already have. You know, using PowerShell Core is, is not something where you gotta go and learn a new language or, or throw out the knowledge that you have. And with NetCore 3, we're gonna bring even more of these APIs and, and GUIs back, uh, including OutGrid View, um, so that you can uh, uh, get a sense of, uh, or, or, or continue to leverage the modules and scripts that you've already built. So I gotta keep moving pretty fast. A lot of this I'm gonna repeat at the 6.2 talk. Definitely come by and check that out if you're, if you're interested. But with NetCore 3, we get WinForms, WPF. We're, we're aiming for 90% module compatibility in these future versions of Windows. Our support life cycle is gonna snap to .NETs. Um, and then, yep, are we, we gotta go to Q&A. Yeah. Oh, great. One hour plus Q&A? No Q&A. We're just using our 15 for the, excellent, awesome. All right, I'll slow it down a little bit. If I have extra time, maybe we'll do five minute Q&A. All right, sweet, thank you. Um, 
So, so our support lifecycle, we're going to snap to .NET. Uh, this basically means that whatever .NET uh, supports in their underlying you know, runtime that we're rehosting PowerShell in, that's ultimately, uh, we're going to have the same, same support dates, same end of life. At some point, we know this thing's got to go into Windows. Uh, we're working out how and when to do that. Uh, we don't have an ETA. Um, it will not likely be the case that 7.0 is immediately going to go into Windows as soon as we GA it. It's going to be a process over time. It's going to show up uh, uh, likely as an optional feature up front that you're going to have to install uh, after installing Windows. We're still working out the support structure. Um, and I don't know if many of you, did anybody see the announcement on, on .NET 5? Yeah, so, so .NET is basically doing what what we wanted to do, um, which is, uh, or what we are doing, which is dropping core from the product name. Um, they're sort of seeing uh, .NET 5 as, as the unification of, of their .NET framework and .NET core, just like we do uh, with PowerShell 7. Um, and they're revving up the version number to really signal this unification uh, the same way we are. So this is why we decided to go with 7.0 instead of 6.3. Um, this does not mean that we now feel comfortable making a large swath of breaking changes. We do occasionally make breaking changes in PowerShell. Uh, we're we're going to speak more to that in the RFC and, and 6.2 talks. But this is really about signaling uh, a transformative shift in PowerShell and signaling how, uh, what we feel is the readiness of PowerShell core to, to be adopted by Windows PowerShell customers and, and really to, to bring our platform back onto one, one single path. So again, .NET 5, this unification, they're dropping core from the name. This is shipping at the end of 2020, so it's a little further off, but the, the goal here is to, to really fully, uh, at least in spirit, replace uh, .NET framework. It'll have better performance, a smaller memory footprint. Uh, there's a bunch of new interop with, with other languages. So, so they're adding, oops, adding bindings to, to Java, Objective-C, Swift. A lot of these are for mobile app development, but, but we're going to look at these features and sort of see if there's any opportunity uh, for PowerShell to integrate that. Obviously, better performance and a smaller memory footprint's good for everybody. Um, but, but we're going to look into, you know, as, as .NET 5 uh, is, is unraveled a little more, how we can leverage some of these, these new features. We will eventually move to this thing. We're, we're tracking with .NET very closely, uh, but really stay tuned for, for more info here, uh, as a lot is, is still unknown on our site as well. So let's talk a little bit about Windows PowerShell and the ISC, which I know is, you know, this was at 90% uh, Tobias that was the, in, the, in the room here that's using that. Yep, so it's so obviously still very, very important. As Jeffrey said, uh, I don't foresee a world where Windows PowerShell goes away. Uh, the same goes for ISC. We don't, we don't have any plans to remove these things uh, from the operating system as long as people are using them and they're useful to folks. Uh, I, I tried very hard uh, maybe three years ago to uh, remove PowerShell 2.0 um, even as an optional feature inside of Windows. And it became very clear that uh, that was sort of a non-starter. A lot of stuff still depended on it, even as an optional feature. So we went down the path of deprecation, but, but we still really don't have a removal plan there. Uh, I can sort of foresee the same thing happening with Windows PowerShell, but again, we're kind of coalescing on, on the right thing to do here. Note that we have made some changes to Windows PowerShell, so while we're not uh, doing any new feature work, there's no new commandlets, no new language features. We have made some changes here and there for the sake of accessibility. Uh, these are changes that we've also made in PowerShell core, but that have been backported to, to Windows PowerShell. And additionally, there's been some security fixes that we, we are committed to making, uh, servicing fixes, fixes, excuse me, if we ever regress anything uh, that's impactful, we're, we're going to go back and fix that. But by and large, we're trying to maintain the stability of this platform and really make sure that you guys can rely on it not changing so that your scripts and automations that you, automation that you've built for Windows PowerShell continue to work. Um, many of you know about our user voice, which is where we fielded feedback on Windows PowerShell for a number of years now. Uh, Unfortunately, I've done, and I, I take a lot of the blame here, uh, probably all, um, <laughs> uh, I've not done a good job of triaging this thing. Um, and I recognize that it's become a little bit of a black hole for Windows PowerShell issues. Um, I check it once every couple months, uh, look at the top, top votes, uh, sort of skim through them, make sure that we're not doing anything uh, horrendous. Um, but, but it's likely that this thing is, is, is going to go away, uh, at least read only in the future. Uh, and if you have any issues that are still relevant to PowerShell Core or PowerShell 7, please refile them as GitHub issues to make sure that we fix that uh, in, in the new platform going forward. But, but we are minimizing the, the, the 
fixes and, and changes being made to Windows PowerShell. We do not have plans uh, to make Core work against the ISC as we are investing heavily in PowerShell editor services and Visual Studio Code. We recognize that a lot of folks love the ISC and again, don't expect to rip it out. Really, we, we want it to, to stay as close uh, to, to the way it works today as possible, um, but we may make some changes for accessibility uh, in the same way that we've, we've made them for Windows PowerShell. So I want to invite Jeffrey back up, uh, talk a little bit about Q&A here. But PowerShell, oh, three more minutes, yeah? Okay. It's fine. <clears throat> yeah, so again, kind of highlight that you know, PowerShell is really all about you. And I started this saying that, you know, it's 2019 and PowerShell has been, never been more important. And then I talked about how software was building the world and how software people were so critical and automation was the critical pillar of this new world. And so when you dial that all together and say, what does that really mean? The answer is it's 2019 and you have never been more important. So this is a great time to be uh, in the industry. It's a great time to learn PowerShell. Uh, and this is a great time to up your skills in PowerShell. So it's a great to have you here. So we've got a couple minutes for, for questions. Actually, we don't, because I'm, I'm yeah? grabbing the time. Thank you so much. Apparently, we don't. Did you want to speak to this one? Okay.